incoming freshmen and sitting at a table facilitating icebreakers and selling the school with other student leaders. When Susan walked over to tell Thomas something, perhaps about feeding their kitten or meeting at Putnam's after for dinner. <laughs> he appeared to oblige to whatever Susan asked and when he walked away, the shy and giggly future child study majors asked in awe, is that your mother? <laughs> and she's actually here tonight too, Joanna Biss, where is she? A superstar upperclassman child study major replied, yes, that's Susan, she's our queen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that one statement says it all. It is my privilege to introduce Susan as tonight's faculty presenter. And you can all go home now, <laughs> because there's nothing left to say. Let's see. Michael, you need to get rid of this. Okay. Oh, those were more lovely pictures, aren't they nice? So you have to indulge me. I do have a PowerPoint. There has been a lot of conversation today, particularly, about how long I'm supposed to talk. <laughs> uh, there have been a few very, very rude people who said, not long. <laughs> I, I'm insulted, very insulted. But then there were other people who said, oh, you should go for an hour. That's what I did, go for an hour. I'm not going for an hour. That's ridiculous. It might, it might be 10 minutes. <laughs> but there are, there is one of the four slides where I will do very little of the talking. Because if you're a junior or a senior, you know what's on this slide and I'm relying on you. So get ready. And I will be making note of who talks and who doesn't <laughs> for participation grades. All right, so I need to start, come totally off book. It's not about special ed. Special ed is my field. We're not gonna talk about real special ed. We're gonna talk about the special ed of Susan. So I came here in 1988, and I was just a child. <laughs> I was just a babe. And I, I grew up in East Flatbush, Brooklyn. Uh, my dad was a Methodist minister, still is, a Methodist minister. And I never had heard of St. Joseph's College. I had never heard of Clinton Hill, Fort Greene, none of it. But I got married, and I moved into this neighborhood because it was the one that we could afford which tells you something back in 1987 that this neighborhood was affordable. So I moved in and my husband said, you know, it's ridiculous that you adjunct up at Columbia. Why don't you try to get a position at one of the three colleges in this neighborhood? So that sounded like a good idea. And I, I think I cold called in and, and brought my resume here. And I brought my resume to Pratt as well as LIU. But the person who interviewed me, I can't even remember who it was. I want to say that it was um, Sister George, maybe not Sister George. Who could it have been? Sister Mary Florence? And she said, well, there's a, there's a full-time opening. Was it you, Sister Mary Florence? You don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> but, but I think it was Sister Mary Florence, and she goes, well, there's a full-time position. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> okay, but the thing is, I had never heard of this place. And I walked in, and my whole department was made up of nuns. I had never met a nun before. <laughs> I didn't know anything about working with nuns. And it was Sister Alice and Sister Rosemary Lesser and um, Sister Ann Berry. These three wonderful women who unfortunately have all recently passed. Uh, but I feel okay about it. I hope I don't cry. I feel okay about it because I know that they're looking over me. When so green, so, so ridiculously green, and they, they, took, they just took over. They took over, I, I was, it was as if I was like having a remake over, you know? They, they, they watched over me and made sure that I did fine and I, I imprinted on them like a gosling. You know, doing everything that they did and asking their permission for everything and would you do it this way? And you know, they, they just really watched over me like they were my mom's. And it was a wonderful few years and they got me through the first few years of teaching, which were not easy and they got me through the birth of all of my children. That was definitely not easy. The two of my children are here, not sitting together. What a shock. Um, 
<laughs> yes, of course my daughter was early. If you want to know someone who is exactly me, it's Brianna. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so they got me through this, and then I had a second wave of nunnery. And, and, and then it was Sister Pat, and Sister Betty, and Sister Margaret. They took over, and they, they made sure, at that, that, that I was at a different point at that, at that stage. I was becoming chairperson, and they made sure I did that fine. And then the third stage was when I was already comfortable in, in a leadership role, and that was when Sister Elizabeth and you, Sister Loretta, took over. And I, I now am in a girl band <laughs> with Sister Nancy and Sister Marianne. And Sister, you know, you would have been in the girl band, but you decided to go off solo <laughs> to be retired, and you ruined everything. But, but I, I kind of feel like um, I was raised by the nuns. You know, like not as an orphan or anything. I have parents, <laughs> and they loved me, and they were good. But I feel that I was raised by the nuns. And now, you ever hear the phrase um, "work husband"? I don't have one, but I do have a work mother, and that is Sister Mary Savillo. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I, I just feel that my whole life has been completely shaped by these women. And so I wanted to take a little time, in spite of the fact that I'm losing time for my precious slides. Um, now two of my 10 minutes are gone. Um, but I, I, I wanted to start with this because it's the centennial of this wonderful college. Honestly, I wish I went here. I, I didn't, but I wish I had. It, it's a, I got a, I, you get a much better education than I did. And I went to a, a residential private school, you know, in a different state. What you are learning in your child study and education courses is um, extraordinary. And I wish that I had had that experience as an undergrad. I, I truly do. I think that what you all need to realize, because you don't know three quarters of the women who I just named, but what I want you to know is that this school is a 100 years old, and it is the nuns, and the nuns are the college. And that had to be said. It's not said very often especially lately, but it had to be said because it wouldn't be the place that it is. So my talk is going to be about special education. It's past, it's present, it's future. And I have nine minutes, eight minutes. I'm gonna take more than that, fine. But so this slide is the past. And, and a lot of people say to me, why do we have to talk about the past? History is boring. Sorry, is Phil here? <laughs> but, but, you know, people say history is boring. Why do we need to know a lot of dates, crazy dates? And I think that what I want you to understand is not that any of this would need to be memorized, but that if you don't understand where you come from, you don't understand how far you've come. It's really important to understand the past. And the past in special ed is very checkered. We got a very late start in the United States. Um, the, the Europe was very, very far ahead of us, a hundred years ahead of us, which, you know, I, I find a little humbling. So we start off in 1550, and oh, by the way, forgive me because I'm gonna butcher these names, but Pedro Ponce de Leon is the man who, if you don't know, um, created a curriculum called oralism. All the way in the 1500s, he set out to educate the deaf. And he set out to educate them by teaching them to speak, which was not typical. It, it still isn't typical. But he did teach them lip reading, and he taught them to speak. I don't think he had universal success, but that was his deal. And then we get to Michelle LePay in the 1700s. And this was the person who created the first public school for special needs children in France. Oh, by the way, France is the star here. Any of you are French, feel proud. We start with Spain, and we end with Great Britain, but everything in between was a product of France. So this first school for special needs children back in 1760 was um, kind of a miracle because there were no laws yet in place in that country to do it. He funded it with his own money. He must have been very wealthy, I'm not sure. But it was the very first public school for students with special needs. And then Hui, I don't think that that's the right way to pronounce it, he created the first school for the blind. 
another first. Now, Jeannie Tart, some of you I think have heard of him because I know that we talk about him in Child Study 101 and 102. Jeannie Tard was um, a psychologist who worked with the deaf and the blind, deaf blind persons who are deaf blind together. But what happened was he lived on an estate in, the, uh, in Averon, and there were woods next to his estate. And one day they actually discovered a young boy. They, they guessed him to be around 13 years old who had clearly been raised in the, wool, in the woods by wolves. And he crawled on all fours and he was covered with fur and he obviously didn't speak. And Jeannie Tard created a whole direct instruction curriculum, way before direct instruction was ever a thing. He created this curriculum to try to teach the wild boy, we probably shouldn't call him that, but that's what is in the literature, and to teach him how to be human again. Now I imagine you've all heard of Braille. You know that it's a system of reading and writing for the blind. And Louis Braille, or Louis probably Braille, was three years old when he was blinded. He wasn't born blind, but he was blinded in an accident. And at the age of 20, he created this system that we still use today. Seguan is the treatise on idiocy. Now that's a terrible, terrible title, I think, but it's a great book. And if you can read French, which I can't, um, but they have it translated, I'm sure, somewhere. And it's all about pedagogy for students with special needs. So finally, in the early 1900s, a full 70 years before we did the same thing, in, this, in this, at the early 1900s, France decided to put special needs children in their general ed schools. Previous to that, everybody had been in a segregated placement, like a special residential or, or day school for the special needs, like we have District 75 now. But in the 1900s, early, early 1900s, France actually put these students in their public schools where typically developing kids were being educated. That was unheard of. And we did not do that for quite some time. So then we go on, last bullet on the left side is Great Britain. I have to give them some kudos because they came up with what they called the Mental Deficiency Act. So those of you who are in child study and you've heard of 94-142, which is the next slide, one of the things I'm gonna ask you about, that's their 94142. Our 94142 didn't come out until 1975. Theirs came out in 1913. I just think it's something to be said. Why were we so behind? Okay, we had things like the Great Depression and the Second World War to deal with. But we were still very far behind. These other places had that World War too. And they still made educational progress. So in the United States, what we were doing was institutionalizing our students with special needs. We started in the late 1800s and we kept doing that. How many of you are from Staten Island or at least know where Staten Island is? So you've heard of Willowbrook, right? Willowbrook wasn't closed until 87. Willowbrook is our uh, biggest New York pimple. You know, I and mean, it's embarrassing what happened at Willowbrook. Back in 1965, RFK, Robert F. Kennedy, I wonder if that's my phone. Okay, um, Robert F. Kennedy called Willowbrook a snake pit, saying that the conditions in that institution were so horrifying that he couldn't believe we still had people there. And that was 65 and it didn't close until 87. So we let it go on, we continued to allow it to happen. And that was our pattern. We had institutions and at these institutions we were practicing the eugenics movement, which meant we were sterilizing all of the patients, clients, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't even know what to say because actually I feel that they were inmates. But we were sterilizing them so that they couldn't procreate, so that they couldn't ruin our race. And, and to me that's, a, that's such a blemish. It's an embarrassment. And it's an embarrassment that we, have, we had these institutions for as long as we did. So in 1922, I think it was sort of the, the draw, the, the, what's the word? The, um, clicking point? I don't, that's not the right phrase. But in 1922, when CEC, the Council for Exceptional Children, was founded, I think that that was a wake-up call for us. Not that it created 94-142, because again, that didn't happen until 1975, but it was the beginning of the recognition. It was the beginning that we needed laws to fix what was happening in this country. So, um, the Council for Exceptional Children led to the National Association for Retarded Children, which was entirely parent-run. And those parents are the ones that brought all those lawsuits. Now, I only put three there, but there are 36 more lawsuits. Too many to detail, of course. 
in my nine minutes, remember? So Brown versus Board of Ed was not really a law about special ed, but it had intense ramifications. It helped us to get to Park versus the Commonwealth and Mills versus the District of Columbia because Brown versus Board of Ed said, no, everybody deserves the same education. It was about ethnicity, but that, that's okay. The premise was still the same. So Park versus Commonwealth said, hey, well, if, if we can give the same education to everyone regardless of their ethnicity, why can't we give the same education to everyone regardless of their ability? And so that was the very first case that was really about special education. And that led us one year later to Mills versus District of Columbia, which led us to 36 more cases all before 1975. So those 38 cases, plus if you count Brown versus Board of Ed, but really it was not a special ed case. 38 special ed cases allowed us to get to the next slide. So the next slide is still the past. I call 108446 the present because it is the present special ed law under which we're operating. Now, all of my students, juniors and seniors, and grad students, because there are a few of you grad students here, you know this slide. Whether you're going to participate or not, I don't know. But it would be real kudos if you did. Because I'm, I've, actually, I need some water. So 94-142 is the best law ever. It was the beginning. And it wasn't, therefore, a perfect law because it has, as you can see, four updates. Because all of these laws are updates of 94-142. 94142 is the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act. Came out in 1975 and was only current for nine years. But it's every law underneath it is based on it. So I, I came up with one, two, three, four, five things you need to know. So I'll tell you the five to 21 because that's the easy thing. It's for kids five to 21. That's easy, right? I didn't know. What to say. I don't need to say anything more. But what's FAPE? Yes. So free and appropriate public education. So what does that matter? Didn't we always have free and appropriate public ed? Well, okay, that's the easy answer. You're not going to help me out here? <laughs> Come on. You wrote me a 22-page paper when I asked for 10. You can detail free and appropriate public ed. <laughs> All right, I'll let him off the hook. So free and appropriate public ed means that no matter what your classification or diagnosis, whether you're severely intellectually disabled, whether you're autistic, whether you're in a wheelchair, whether you're blind, deaf, deaf and blind, no matter what, you are guaranteed a free and appropriate public ed. Now, I always say to my students, this doesn't mean free and best. I can't necessarily send my kid anywhere I want to, but I, but I will have a spot. And that wasn't always the case. Prior to 1975, you could walk up to your local public school and, and bring your child in a wheelchair and the principal could say, no, sorry, no room in the inn. They could absolutely do that. So starting in 1975, they could no longer do that. And that was really, really important. So what's least restrictive environment or LRE? No, 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 there's more. Yes. And so what does that mean to you? OK, I like it. So think about what we had before with all of those institutions where all of these people were being admitted. Those, that was not least restrictive environment, because whether I was mildly impaired or severely impaired, we all were institutionalized. And that was not a least restrictive environment for me. For some people, it would be. If I was extremely severely impaired, maybe you could make a case for me to be in an institution where I had 24-hour care. But let's say I was mildly impaired. Let's say I have a learning disability. Let's say I have a speech and language delay. I shouldn't be institutionalized, should I? So least restrictive environment guarantees what we call a continuum of alternative placement. And it says, sure, where well, there's a triangle. And at the top of the triangle are the really severe um, situations. Where, where students need extreme care. Maybe that's a hospital setting. Maybe that's a residential placement. Maybe it's a, a self-contained school like District 75 schools are. But then we keep going down in the triangle. We keep going down the ladder. And when we get to the bottom, which by the way is the biggest part of the triangle, we have students who can be in general ed. And that's least restrictive environment, that everyone doesn't get the same classroom, that it's not one size fits all. 
that students have to be evaluated and they have to be placed according to their needs. So what's an IEP? Blah, 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 blah. Yes. Everybody gets one. So the minute that you get into the system, you get an IEP. And it's like a contract, although it's not legally binding. But it's a contract which says, by in this particular school year, these are the annual goals that we hope to achieve, and these are the short-term objectives that go under each goal, and this is the criteria upon which we will judge whether the goal has been met. And by the way, page one says this is your classification, and this is your placement option, and these are the related services that you get. So the IEP is like a plan for the whole year, because IEPs do have to be renewed each year. We didn't have anything like that before. That was actually one of the things that Robert F. Kennedy was so aghast about. Of course, the conditions of the place were terrible, but what he was suggesting was that they didn't have any plans. There were no goals. The days just were 24-hour were days, and, and there was no education whatsoever happening at places like Willowbrook. Last but not least, and this is probably the hardest, but I know that some of you can rise to the occasion, what's a procedural safeguard? Nicole, what's a procedural safeguard? <laughs> To protect who? Yes. So procedural safeguards are for families. They're for the child, but they're also for the parents and the families of the child. And the most important one, the one you've probably heard about, is due process. So due process says that if I'm unhappy with my child's IEP or my child's progress in the school or my child's placement option or my child's classification, I have the ability to get a free lawyer who is going to help me to argue my case. I may win, I may lose, but at least I get an opportunity for due process. So this law was absolutely incredible. It changed everything about everything. Whether you were a general ed or a special ed teacher, it didn't matter. This law changed everything about education. And it was good. And we went on to 99,457 in 1986. And, and you'll notice, because we just had to say a lot about 10, um, rather 94, 142. We won't have to say nearly as much about the remaining four laws because they simply build onto the first one. They simply tweak something or add something that's, that's better. So 99,457 had one purpose and one pers purpose only, and it was to bring the law and all of its benefits down to three-year-olds. Because prior to that, we started at five, People saw the benefits of what we were doing for 5 to 21s, and they said, you know what, why aren't we doing this for 3s and 4s? And so they brought the law down to 3, and it was wonderful, and they created something called an IFSP. So who knows what an IFSP stands for? Yes. Right. So the IEP is for the child. The family service plan is for the family. So let's say that my family, who has a special needs child, needs some help. Maybe we need a, a, a daycare worker. Maybe we need uh, counseling. Maybe um, I need help getting a job. Maybe I need help learning how to use the equipment that my child needs for his or her disability. That's what goes on the family service plan. So we still have the IEP for his or her educational goals, but me as a mom get some help too. And that was a beautiful thing. We go down to 101476 in 1990. So this is a law that changed the name. We call this the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA. So you sometimes hear people call it IDEA or IDEA, or sometimes they actually say the whole title. I never do. We really were changing into politically correct terminology, which I think is important. I think it's important. So now instead of calling that 21-year-old a child, which the first law did, now we're going to call that person, whether he's three or whether he's 21, an individual. And we're also going to stop using the word handicapped because people found that offensive. They began to, found it offensive. And so now we're going to call them individuals with disabilities. So that was the first thing. Not, I don't think, as big a deal as the next two things. We came up with two new classifications. So who knows what the two classifications are? Yes? So traumatic brain injury and autism. So previously, autism had been sucked up into the emotional disturbance category, which I didn't think was bad, but I liked the fact 
that they made it its own classification because a classification comes with funding. And you know that's something that I probably should have started by saying, all of these laws are for funding purposes. They are so that federal monies can be funneled into schools that serve children with special needs. So if you have a school that literally doesn't have anyone with an IEP, and by the way, that school don't, no longer exists, but let's say that by some miracle, you were, you were placed at a school that did not have one IEP, one student with an IEP, you would get no federal money. But if you were in a school with two IEPs, or 22 IEPs, or 222 IEPs, et cetera, you would get money by the child by the classification. So what we began to discover starting around 1990, well earlier obviously because it was written into the law, was that the, the autistic needed something different than other persons with emotional disturbance needed. It still is an emotional disturbance, it's still in the DSM-5, but we, came, we made a separate classification so that there could be separate placement options that were appropriate for it and separate, um, separate related services. So, two new classifications, traumatic brain injury and autism, and then what's a transition plan? It starts at 15, that's your big hint. Oh, did somebody have a hand up over there? Yes, thank you. because 21 comes before you know it. And then the federal law stops protecting this child and this family. So we need to make sure that they're ready. We need to make sure that we can help them to transition into a residential setting or a work setting. So a lot of goals on a transition plan, which by the way, the law says has to start at 15. Luckily, uh, in New York City especially, lots of principals start at significantly earlier, fifth grade. I find a lot of principals start at then and I'm very grateful to them because people do need time to learn these transition goals. Very popular transition goals are activities of daily living, learning to cook, learning to shop, learning to do laundry, work skills, learning to work in an environment. A lot of internships come from transition plans where we bring these individuals into work settings, settings which have agreed to take them on and to supervise them. So that was 101-476. 105, 117, seven years later, brought about the idea that, hey, if we're already at three, why don't we go to birth? And unfortunately, it didn't work um, because the law tried to get all of the states to sign on. The, the federal government wasn't willing to pay the whole bill, which they, by the way, pay from three to 21. They pay every dime. But for the birth to three law, they said, well, how about we just give you incentives? Um, in mo most places, it's about half. And 16 states didn't sign on. So as many years later, 1997 to 2016, I, I'm not a good math, that's 19 years, right? 19 years later, we still have 16 states that haven't signed on for the incentives, which means that if you live in one of those states and you have a child, and at birth we know there's a special need, you can't get free services until he or she is three. My advice, move because there are lots of other states that offer the incentives. We're lucky in New York City, we offer the, in New York State, we offer the incentives. In fact, all of the states surrounding us offer the incentives. There are southern states that do not offer the incentives. Um, what? Oh, yes, Texas is one. Okay, so uh, the last thing I wanna say about 105, 117 is about inclusion. Because nowadays, you're all so young, you think inclusion has been around forever, it hasn't. Inclusion is new, and by the way, I'm not embarrassed to tell you that when it started, I was like, oh, this is never gonna last. It did, I was wrong. Um, but the fact is, nowadays, you're hard pressed to find self-contained classes where the only children in the classrooms all have IEPs. But nowadays, everybody does, mo mo many classes, the vast majority, over 80% of all classes for special needs are what we call in New York City, ICT. So we've got a general ed teacher and a special ed teacher and we've got approximately half the students with IEPs and approximately half without. But this started with 105, 117. It was the very first law that ever mandated inclusion. And it didn't mandate it 100% right away. It, it talked about 5% of the classes need to be inclusive by whatever, let's say it was 1999. And they gradually eked it up. So last but not least, I'm sure you're relieved is 108-446, 2004. This is the current law. 
They call it the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. So there's an extra I that no one ever remembers, and it's impossible to spell anyway. So I just call it IDEA 2004, but really I'm lying, it's not. Somehow I would have to get that extra I in. So there are four things you need to know about 108446 or IDEA 2004. Number one, it brought about response to intervention. So what's response to intervention? Yes. Okay, so Joanne is completely right, but I want to say something that she didn't say, which is, it's very sneaky. The federal government is so very sneaky because if you do RTI and you keep kids out of special ed, guess what? The paycheck is gone. The school doesn't get the money that the IAP would have gotten them. So I will point out that you can get RTI monies. You do have to fill out annual reports for them, and many principals follow through with it because especially if you're using RTI rel relatively universally in all of your general ed classes, it really can add up to a pretty penny. But I do want to point out that the main purpose of RTI is to keep kids out of the system. It's something that is supposed to be happening in general ed classes to sort of separate the child who has a real problem from the children who just need a, a tweak or two. They just need a special method or two that any teacher can do if he or she tries. So assistive technology. This is the very first law, federal law, that decided to pay for assistive technology. So that if I need a communication device, a very expensive laptop, or, or, something, or something because uh, cochlear implants, anything like that, it can be put on the IEP, and then the federal government has to kick in the money at least part of it. It really, it, it, it depends on whether you can argue, you might need to get due process for this. You have to argue that it's for school, which is why sometimes you can lose the, lose the case if you, for cochlear implants. I probably shouldn't have used that as an example. But I've seen some cases win, even when we're using some sort of a special need assistive technology outside of school. Mediation is a new due process. It didn't exist in 1975 and it didn't exist in any of those re-ups. Prior to 108.446, we went straight to due process. So if we were unhappy, due process was the next step. Mediation came about to try to save some money because due process was costing literally millions, if not billions of dollars nationally a year. And so the federal government said, hmm, let's get them counseling. It actually is not a bad idea because the counseling kept at least half of the cases out of due process. What happens at the mediation sessions is really just compromise. Let's say that I want my kid to have five sessions of speech therapy a week and the school only wants her to have two. Well, the mediator will say, well, how about we compromise and give her four? And maybe the, the school will say yes. If they don't, I'm still allowed due process. I'm still allowed to drag them into court. But the mediator can prevent that. Last but not least, and I'm sure the federal government would say that this is the most important thing, but I put it last, um, general ed curriculum. So this was the first law, closely followed by the first law we'll talk about on the next side, that talked about the fact that special needs children need to be exposed to the general ed curriculum, that we shouldn't just be uh, worried about their transition plan goals, that we shouldn't just be preparing them for um, a job, or we shouldn't just be preparing them to learn how to use the washing machine. And I, I'm being kind of facetious because for so many years before I came here, I was a teacher, and of course I taught math and reading, but, I, but I'm going to be honest with you, my students were very low IQ and many of them were nonverbal. What I was teaching them was certainly not chronologically appropriate. And this law, for the first time, said, we got to think about this, we've got to work on this. So that creates a segue for the next law, which is No Child Left Behind. So No Child Left Behind, believe it or not, even though it's a 2001 law, is our present. Because ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, even though it was signed in 2016, it doesn't actually go into effect until 2017. So we are all still operating under NCLB. And I always try to um, hide my feelings about NCLB when I talk about it, because I, I don't really like NCLB very much. But I will say this, it's the truth. It had a good beginning. The people who created NCLB had very good reasons 
for wanting this act to happen. They, what they were noticing, and it wasn't about special ed, by the way, NCLB nor ESSA, they're not special ed laws. The previous slide were the special ed laws. These are the education laws, and they unfortunately, in my opinion, cover children with special needs, whether they're mildly impaired or severely impaired, and that's the part that bothers me. I don't have a problem with NCLB or ESSA being applicable to students with mild disabilities. But I do have a real problem when you think about the severe population, some of the things that these two laws require, in my opinion, are unfair. So let's get to that. Um, number one, um, federal oversight. So when NCLB came along, they were very upset because what they were seeing was people were dropping out of uh, high school at alarming rates, and the people who were graduating couldn't read. That was the, that was the, um, the rumor, anyway. And so they said, we were leaving those children behind. And so they said, the education system has failed those children. We've got to figure out a way so that the education system stops failing all of these children. And so they said, first, that we have to have what they called high quality education. OK, well, that's a no brainer. You know, who would ever say, let's give low quality education? I mean, <laughs> none of us would ever say that. But I guess that was what they thought, that we all were like shooting for low quality education. So they had defined it. And they defined low quality I mean high quality education as a few things. The most significant thing that I think affected many of us in the field was that now every teacher had to be highly qualified. And the highly qualified teacher had to now be certified. Now, those of you who are in the department now, you're thinking, well, what's the big deal? Well, it, it was a big deal. Because back then, there were lots of uncertified teachers in the classroom. Well, some of them were certifiable, <laughs> Phyllis, but some of them were pretty darn great teachers. Some of them were excellent teachers, but they had not been forced prior to this to finish their education or to pass a certification exam. Now, you guys are all passing four and six and eight certification exams, and you feel sorry for yourselves, right? <laughs> so, all right, now these poor people have been working maybe for 10, 20, 30 years, and now all of a sudden they're being told, do this or you lose your job. So I think that although I understand the need for qualified teachers, and by the way, I still say, like, what were we all so low qualified? I mean, I st it was whatever. They said everybody had to be certified. They also talked about high stakes tests. Now, this is the reason why I think most people dislike NCLB, because it was the beginning of the annual required tests that everyone had to pass or they would be left back after summer school. They would get an extra chance in summer school, I know. But the point is that these tests would have to be passed. They called it ELA and math proficiency. And it was a struggle, even for some typical children. But imagine being a child with an IEP. Imagine being a child with attention deficit disorder or autism or at the time what we called mental retardation, which we no longer call anymore. We call it intellectual disabilities. But imagine some of the more severely affected amongst us having to pass the same tests, by the way, as the kids who were gifted and talented. It wasn't fair, and it still isn't. It's not fair. But it started back in 2001. And that led to accountability, which is the number two most important thing of NCLB. The idea that if you, as a teacher, or you as a principal, or you as, by the way, a teacher prep program, don't have enough passing scores, there are federal penalties. So for example, a school couldn't get certain federal grants if they didn't have a certain number of, a certain percentage of their students passing. That's, by the way, what AYP is, adequate yearly progress. So the best thing about ESSA is that adequate yearly progress is gone. The other best thing about ESSA, from your perspective as future teachers, is that your ability to get tenure, that's what we call it in New York City, your ability to get tenure as a teacher is no longer tied to your students' test scores. It used to be. I can remember, while I was a teacher here, picking up the daily news and seeing teachers' names printed in the paper. Like Susan Strott Collard, only 60% of her students passed the ELA. Really? Like you have to shame me in front of everyone? But that was an NCLB. 
That was absolutely an NCLB initiative. So it's gone now. Now, that doesn't mean that your principal can't find another reason not to give you tenure. Uh, truthfully, I'm, I'm being honest with you. They're not going to like it if your students don't pass. I'm not suggesting it no longer matters at all. But it's no longer a federal requirement that a teacher has to have a certain percentage of her students. Ugh. All right. So we're not going to go over all of these things. We're not. Just not going to do it. I will say a few things that I like about ESSA. It hasn't started yet. That's the first thing. The second thing I like about it is that now states are in control, whereas the federal government used to be in control. The federal government would set all of the measures. Now individual states can set them. So I have to tell you that you're not going to care, but it's, it's a double-edged sword. Um, the reason why I'm nervous about states setting their own um, goals is because some people might go insane and make them even worse than the federal government would have. But let's pretend that that's not going to happen. It's still nice to get the federal government out of our pocket. So the other thing I like is that there's broader accountability. I think this is the last thing I'll say, and then we'll move on. Broader accountability means that under NCLB, it was just those annual test scores, the ELA and the math. That's all they looked at. That's all that mattered. Now, there are eight things, and you can choose a minimum of four of them, but you can choose as many as eight measures of whether students have been successful. So for example, we can use portfolios now. We never used to be able to do that. We always had to depend solely on the test scores. But now school districts and principal, individual principals can make decisions to use portfolio assessment. They can't ignore the annual tests. Those still have to be one of the eight, but, or one of the four actually. But I like the idea that there's broader accountability. Second thing, I said I wasn't going to say anything more. I'm a liar. Um, I want to say th something about L's, English language learners. We didn't have any provisions to help L's in NCLB. But under ESSA, we do. For the first two years, you don't have to count their test scores. So in theory, anyway, that should help them, we hope, to catch up. It should help them. And I'm not even talking about it from the perspective of I want them to catch up for my school's sake. I want them to catch up for their sake. But we can give them the opportunity to not have to worry about those an agonizing high stakes test because you know kids get upset too it's not just administrators it's children and families and teachers who are upset about taking these tests so I love the fact that the L's don't have to take them for at least a year if not two all right I'm almost done I swear so this has nothing to do with you it has everything to do with me so I'm going to sh be shameless and and make you listen because there are things that I'm gonna have to do for some of you in order to fulfill the new U.S. Department of Education regs. They're for teacher prep programs. So they're not for you, they're for us. Schools like St. Joseph's College that have to adhere to new regulations. They just came out seven days ago. When, when I saw it on the, I'd already made this PowerPoint presentation and I got an email with these new regs them. I'm like, damn. Now I have to revise this. <laughs> I'd add a slide. You would have been done. We would have been on our way out. But I just want to mention a few things that I'm going to need from you. Because what these new regs say is that teacher prep programs have to be judged. Now, that, they always had to be judged. I'm not going to pretend that that wasn't the case. But there are some new ways that we're going to be judged now. And one of them has to do with placement and retention rates. So those of you who already graduated or in the grad program know that when you left our undergrad program, we sneakily asked you for your personal email addresses and then we began to bombard you with emails, <laughs> begging you to tell us where you were working and whether you were in grad school. And so you should all expect that, that will happen to you. But now I have to follow you for three years. So you're not just gonna get that one year's email. You're gonna be hearing from me again and again. It's like a bad penny and I'm gonna find you. You are not going to hide from me. You, I'm going to find you. What I'm going to ask is, that why not just make it easy? I can just send one email, not 21, right? Just answer the first one. Answer the first one. Tell me if you're still in the field, because that's what they mean by retention. They are afraid that many teachers leave the field within the first three years. And so I, my program, any, any education prep program, is being judged on whether too many of our students leave the field within the first three years. We want to make you strong teachers who are confident enough. Not you're going to be perfect. The first three years are, let's face it, kind of nightmarish. But, but that's the truth for anyone. 
That's the truth for anyone. I want you to stick it out, and I need to travel with you to make sure you do. I also need to know where you're working and in what kind of a classroom. Are you special ed? Are you general ed? Are you self-contained? Are you ICT? So those are the questions I'm going to be asking you, and just do me a favor, answer them. And then I'm going to have to, this is even less comfortable, I have to go to your principals and say, hey, how's she doing? Nobody wants to talk to me then. You're not happy that I'm doing it. They're not happy that I'm doing it. But guess what? The federal government says I have to collect that info. So help me out here. You know, help me out. Tell your principal he or she is allowed to answer that question. Because when I ask this question of many principals, they say, oh, that's confidential. The federal government says I need this information. So I'm going to ask you for how you're doing a year out. Because you know you do the exit survey like 10 minutes before you graduate. And then a year out, I'm going to send it to you again. And then a year out, I'm going to send it to you again. And then three years out, I'm going to send it to you again. And then you never have to hear from me again. But you have to answer it, please, I'm begging. OK, last but not least, I'll just talk about the exit requirements. Because I thought this was so interesting, different than the previous things we had to do. They used to ask us about our entry requirements. They used to say, hey, you can't let just anybody into your program. Because if you do, that means you don't care about the children of America. You don't care about the people that you're preparing to be teachers. But what this law says is, no, 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 it's not entry, it's exit. And I like that, because you guys are going to be great when you leave. You're going to be great. You are. Many of you have already graduated, and you are already great. But when you come in as a freshman, what difference does it make what you got in high school biology? What matters is how you did here. And what, I'm sorry, I know, Michael. You like high school biology. I'm just telling you that the federal government says that now high school biology doesn't matter. <laughs> but they want to know what your GPA is exiting college. They want to know whether you passed the certification exams. They want to know that we're going to have to give you a disposition rating. There's all kinds of things that we're going to do upon your leaving us to prove that we created, we, we shaped you, we molded you, we, we mentored you. And I think that that's a much fairer thing. And the thing that I like about it is it'll up our diversity. Did you know that 84% of teachers in this country are Caucasian? 50%, over 50%, I think it's 51%. No, 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 it must be higher. I have it written down here somewhere. Give me a second. 76%, totally wrong. 76% are female. Now, entry, exit, doesn't matter. You're still going to be female or male. But, but, but what I'm thinking, what I'm thinking is that if I don't have to worry about entrance requirements, we can get out a more diverse pool of teachers. And we can create what the standard of the federal government is, which is that the pool of teachers matches the pool of students for the district or the state or, or the country. And right now, we don't match that at all. Certainly, we do not have 84% of all the children in, the in this country being Caucasian. It's absolutely false and inappropriate. So I want to say thank you to you for listening. Sorry I went over my 10 minutes. <laughs> Do you have any questions? I'll be gracious. I, I. Do you want to ask a question, Michael, about those bio scores? By the way. <laughs> Yeah, they only require science in eighth grade, and, and ESSA does also only require science in eighth grade. But that test would count for some Oh, yes, yes, good, that's good. Be well, I don't have the slide up anymore, but remember I said the accountability measures will have increased. Um, they can be one of them. It happens in New York, too. Yeah, they could care less. So they want to go. <laughs> yes. Oh, you mean a doctoral program? 
Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. I thought you were saying post-masters. Uh, we haven't started any planning about it. You could shoot me an email and we could talk about it. I will say that if it's at LIU, one of the things the state wants is for us to create programs that aren't in the vicinity. But we, let's talk about it. Let me know. Thank you. Thank you. I feel so out of place not uh, being a, an alum and not being part of St. Joseph's College for Women like uh, everybody else is thinking. Um, but the nuns helped you too. That's true, they did. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to thank Susan for a wonderful talk. Thank you, Sister Helen, for coming, to Elizabeth. Um, uh, thank you, Jamie. Jamie is, of course, very responsible for all planning of everything. And thank you for your introduction. And Paige from the alumni office. Um, I'd like to also point out that I had Jamie for class, too. She dropped my class after the first day. It was my first class here. It was kind of disconcerting to have that. Um, we have one more uh, Centennial Lecture this semester. That will be on November 30th. That is the Professor Josephine Beloso and Dr. Robert Radis Centennial Lecture in the Fine Arts. And uh, uh, William Trevino from the uh, Speech Communication Department will be our speaker. I know that uh, Professor Beloso will be here for that. Um, in the spring, we're planning four more lectures. And I think I can announce what they're going to be. They're going to be Centennial Lectures in English, History, Psych, and the Sciences. Okay, so I hope you can make that when that, that information comes out. Thanks, everybody, for coming.